Welcome, and thank you for joining today's Inside Bowers & Wilkins to get a sneak peek at the 800D4 series products. We're extremely excited to bring these great new products, all of us from Sound United. With me today are Eric and Derek, who are gonna take you through a deeper dive. Enjoy. Thanks, James. My name is Derek Everson. I'm the brand activation manager for Sound United. Welcome to a suburb of Boston. We're in this quiet street, a inconspicuous brick building. Doesn't look like much on the outside, but once you get inside, that's where the real magic happens. We're gonna take you through a technological review of the D4 Diamond Series, as well as a lineup, and then most importantly, spend some time with the Grammy Award winning John Newton. Next, I'm gonna kick it over to Eric inside. He's gonna be able to take you through some technical details. Hello, and welcome to Inside Sound United. My name is Eric McBride, and I am the Premium Audio Brand Manager. And today's a very exciting day because we're gonna show you the latest generation of our 800 Diamond Series. We're gonna start off with the stereo models. Up first, we have the 805D4 bookshelf loudspeaker, featuring a one inch Diamond Dome tweeter and a six and a half inch continuum mid bass driver. You also notice the reverse wrap cabinetry, which matches the rest of the line. Next, we have the 804D4, featuring a one inch Diamond Dome tweeter, 5-inch Continuum FST mid-range and two 6.5-inch airfoil base drivers. As we are using a Continuum FST, we now use the BMS or biomimetic suspension for the mid-range. You'll also notice we have the reverse cabinet wrap and there's a new port and plinth assembly located on the bottom of the unit. Now we have the 803D4, the first model to incorporate all the new technology. Featuring a 1-inch diamond dome, a five inch continuum FST, turbine head with the double tune mass dampeners, two seven inch aerofoil base drivers, and it looks absolutely stunning. Now we have the 802 D4, the most popular 800 series loudspeaker, featuring a one inch diamond dome, six inch continuum FST mid, turbine head, and two eight inch aerofoil base drivers. And lastly, we have the 801 D4, our flagship model, it's everything we know and everything we are. Featuring a one inch diamond dome tweeter, a six inch continuum FST mid-range, a turbine head featuring triple the amounts of tuned mass dampeners, and lastly, two 10 inch airfoil base drivers. For home theater applications, Bowers & Wilkins offers two center channels. We have the HTM82 D4, featuring a one inch diamond dome tweeter, five inch continuum FST mid-range, the mid-range pod, and two six and a half inch airfoil base drivers. The second option for center channels is the HTM 81 D4. This features a one inch diamond dome, a six inch continuum FST mid-range, the mid-range pod, and two eight inch airfoil base drivers. All right, now that you had a chance to see the entire lineup, let's talk about the technology because there's a ton of it. All right, we're gonna start from the top and work our way down. So. At the top of the loudspeaker is the tweeter. This is the tweeter body. This is something that we're very proud of. It took a number of years to, to develop. This is what we call the elongated tweeter body. And the reason why we were able to uh, use this particular form factor is because of the advancements that we made in the tweeter itself. So we're still using the same diamond dome because there's nothing wrong with it. It just sounds absolutely incredible. But what we've done is we've changed the former. So the former is what the voice coil is attached to. What we've done is we've actually vented this former to allow the tweeter to be more efficient. When a tweeter is more efficient, the system as a whole is more efficient and you essentially get better resolution and higher detail with those upper register frequencies. So by looking at the graph, the exploded view that's up on the screen right now, Working from the left to the right, you see the tweeter grill, pretty standard. You see that diamond dome that we're talking about. But the next piece is that coil. That coil is, is absolutely crucial to the performance of that tweeter assembly. And then as you work your way back, you have the baffles, you have the motor system, etc. But again, because of this tweeter body being as long as it is in those formers, the system as a whole is just more efficient. And the result is beautiful top end, not abrasive at all. It's just very musical and just beautiful. All right, working our way down from the tweeter body itself, we have a completely new two-point decoupling system. So why is that important? 
with the predecessor, we had a one point decoupling system. So if any of you have ever walked up to the speaker, you were able to actually move the tweeter body quite a bit. What we've done now is taking two points of interest on the tweeter body, and we've uh, mounted it to the turbine head using these new L brackets that we have here. These L brackets have a series of different uh, coupling mechanisms on it, tons of rubber, silicone, and it really just quiets down the entire system as a whole. The next technology I want to talk about is within the mid-range driver. As you can see, we're still using the Continuum FST. FST stands for Fixed Suspension Transducer. Still using the anti-resonance plug, but the real magic is what we changed on the back of the driver. So two parts. Number one, the motor assembly. The motor assembly we've changed, we've updated. We're now using a double copper motor system. And what this does is essentially reduce the amount of EMI that's transferred into the cone. So it results in better resolution and better detail. But the true star of the show is what's happening behind the cone. It's what we call the BMS or biomimetic suspension. So what is biomimetic suspension? Before we get into that key technology, let's talk about what a spider is. A spider is located on each driver assembly. The job of the spider is to hold the cone and the voice coil in place. So while the driver is excurting, nothing starts to distort. When things start to distort, that creates distortion. So what we've done at Bowers and Wilkins is we've taken what looks like a traditional spider and we changed it to this. This is what a biomimetic suspension is. And now we're going to talk about why this is better than this. As you can see from the animation, we have a standard spider on the left and the biomimetic suspension on the right. We are feeding a tone at four kilohertz into each. All of the red and blue that you see is essentially coloration and distortion. This is bad. This is what muddies up your mid-range vocals. With the biomimetic, because we have limited connection points, all of the rear standing waves that produce that coloration and distortion are essentially minimized throughout the chassis. And the result is clear, defined, mid-range tonality. New to the 800 series is the mounting method for the mid-range. We're now using a two-part decoupling system. It's mounted directly to the cabinet, and the result is superior dampening than its predecessor. And what does that mean? That results in clearer, more defined mid-range tonality. Now looking at the base driver, I'm gonna focus on the cone and then work our way backwards. So we're still using the aerofoil technology, which is carbon fiber skins with variable thickness of foam, thicker in the middle and then tapers off towards the end. We're also using the anti-resonance plug. Anti-resonance plug is very important because it absorbs all those unwanted cone reflections. As we flip this over, we're also using a new revised spider. It's lighter and stiffer, and it results in better control of the driver assembly. The neodymium magnet is elongated so that we have higher excursion, and the result is deeper, better bass response. We've also made some significant advancements in the enclosures. I've already showed you the solid body elongated tweeter. Right next to me is the turbine head assembly. This is where the mid-range lives. Inside this turbine, we have fins. Each fin is surrounded with a TMD. That's called a tuned mast dampener. What these do essentially is reduce the amount of resonance within the enclosure. And again, results in clearer, more defined mid-range. Just below that is the interface top plate. Now, when you look at it, you may think it's just an aesthetic. It's not. It actually stiffens up the cabinetry to allow a better coupling of the turbine head to the cabinet. But also because it is a solid piece of aluminum, it makes the cabinet more inert, thus resulting in less cabinet resonances. Looking at the wrap itself, it is a reverse wrap on the 801, 802, 803, but you'll notice that we have adopted the reverse wrap on the 804 and 805 as well, thus increasing the inertness of the cabinet resulting in bigger, better, tighter base response. We've also made some advancements within the matrix bracing itself. We've added aluminum structures throughout the cabinet, targeting specific resonances we wanted to delete. And lastly, we've updated the plinth assemblies. So on the headed products, we now have different casters that rotate 360 degrees. And we also have an outrigger, which allows for more stability. One of the biggest things you'll notice though is with the 804D4. 
this unit now has a plinth assembly. So we, by doing that, we were able to have a downward firing port, which results in better base response and more time aligned base response. Now let's take a look at the animation. We're using a finite element analysis machine here, measuring resonances within the cabinetry. On the left hand side, you can see an 800D3. On the right hand side, you can see an 801D4. Similar to the biomimetic suspension animation, all the red and yellow you see is distortion and coloration. So as you can see, all the additional metal componentry makes a significant difference. Another significant update with an enclosure can be found in our center channel models. What I'm holding right here is what we call the mid-range pod. This sits directly behind the FST continuum mid-driver. So as you can imagine, this is trying to duplicate what the turbine head does. All these ridges that you see here play a part in diffusing unwanted resonances. Again, this is found in the center channel models, the HTM81 and HTM82. Now let's focus on the crossover assemblies. What I have in my hands is the 805D4 crossover located on the rear spine. As you can see, it looks pretty simple. That's because at Bowers & Wilkins, we believe less yields more. Very simple topology is what we're all about. If you look at the cap, this cap was specifically designed for us by a company called Mundorf. It's a proprietary design and we're the only ones that can use it. As we move up the range and get into the headed products, we've updated the crossover significantly. With the 803D4, we're using a 47 microfarad Supreme oil capacitor. With the 802, we've actually split the capacitance. Now we're using dual 22 microfarad Supreme oil capacitance. This results in much cleaner top end. And then when we get to the 801D4, we've now are using uh, Mundorf's latest and greatest technology, they call it the Angelique Supreme Oil Capacitor. Hi, I hope you enjoyed that video. It was great going through the technical details of the 800 series diamond. And one thing we really want to spend some time on is really what it means to be the professional's choice when it comes to a loudspeaker. So when you have you know, some of the best industries as far as music reproduction for both movies and film, um, those music studios, they love to use this as a tool to be able to deliver the best content to the users. So famous studios such as um, Abbey Road Studios as well as Skywalker Sound. Yeah, so we're here today at Sound Mirror. Sound Mirror's impact on the classical music industry is world renowned. John Newton, who heads up the place, is an amazing engineer. He is very well respected in the industry and well awarded as well. And a few uh, days ago, I had the opportunity to actually sit down and talk shop with him. So that's what we're going to do now. So please take a couple minutes and enjoy this interview with John Newton from Sound Mirror. My name is John Newton. I uh, started Sound Mirror about 50 years ago, and we're a classical music production company. We go around the world recording orchestras and operas and choruses and soloists to make commercial recordings. What would you say is most critical when engineering an album? Well, the, the album success is a combination of the musical values and the engineering and technical values. And in terms of the technical values, uh, the most important thing is that we need to know what our microphones are saying to us. So we need a good listening environment. Where does your love for music come from? Well... The first time I heard uh, an orchestra rehearsing when I was a little boy and my dad took me to the local community orchestra rehearsal, I was captivated. And my love of music grew from then. And the more I heard wonderful music performed by great musicians, the more I came to like it. You're internationally recognized and have carved out this incredible career, having over 130 nominations, 29 awards, what sets you apart? I suppose uh, what sets us apart more than anything else is that uh, I have formed a group of teams here at Sound Mirror, and the individuals who are part of these teams have a variety of uh, capabilities all based in the acoustical music re recording area. And 
we can identify a project as having certain needs, and we have a team members that can come together and uh, meet those needs, which is quite different than uh, a lot of other uh, individual recording engineers might be able to do. 130 nominations, 29 wins. Do you have a favorite? Well, let's be clear. The, the, the number of nominations are represent probably 30 years of working with great artists around the world um, in a variety of categories. Uh, we don't have any favorites. We're, we're often asked what's our favorite recording, and we all will answer, because it's very true, the last one we worked on. Uh, in terms of, of Grammys, they're... they're uh, an award that is given to a project that has both great musical values as well as great technical values. And we're obviously only responsible for part of that. The musicians that we work with are responsible for the hard, much harder work of creating good music and allowing us to record it. Many of your recordings are in multi-channel and SACD. Why multi-channel? Well, the real, the answer to the important question is why multi-channel or surround recordings? Uh, what we strongly believe, having been making multi-channel recordings now for probably 20 years, is that they can sound better than a great stereo recording if they're done well. Uh, the answer to the question why SACD, uh, it is the first practical format that allowed distribution to the consumer of multi-channel music. It was developed by, jointly by Sony and Philips uh, at, at the time that the patent on the compact disc was getting ready to run out and they needed to reintroduce some new technology to the consumer marketplace. And I think people will generally acknowledge that it was about the last physical format that will ever be released to deliver music to consumers. What was your first experience with Bowers & Wilkins? I was working for a then very small startup company in New York City called Dolby Laboratories. And in the same space as Dolby Laboratories was a classical music production company. And they had brought in a pair of Bowers & Wilkins speakers that looked like no loudspeaker I'd ever seen before. And we were able to listen to them listening to the project they were working on, and they had a very interesting sound. And after they were returned, I sort of forgot about the brand. But when I started working myself, making recordings in studios and in other uh, parts of Europe especially, everywhere we traveled, we came across Bowers and Wilkins speakers, usually 801s. And we quickly realized that they had a tremendous uh, musical value and each pair sounded exactly like the other pair no matter where we went. And Bowers and Wilkins was very interested in helping us and if we needed to borrow a pair of speakers in some out of the way place and we made a phone call, they always showed up on time and they worked well and that began what's now almost a 50 year relationship with the company. You've now worked on several different generations of 800 series. How has the performance evolved? I think the performance has consistently gotten better because the musicality of the speaker has improved. It's not a matter of frequency response or this or that. The speakers integrate into difficult rooms much more easily and they have the same family characteristic sound, which is important because we need to know in the field what we're doing, and we need to make sure that that will carry over into the consumer's listening place. John, why Bowers and Wilkins? Well, that's a good question. We've been using Bowers and Wilkins speakers for the better part of our 50-year history. Uh, we learned about them because they were the go-to speaker in the professional world of classical music recording. And once we first started with them, we realized that they, they were really very good loudspeakers. They were quite musical, and they translated well from room to room and venue to venue. 
and each succeeding generation of speakers has gotten better, more musical. All right, John, it's been a pleasure. I really do appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule, joining us today and letting us use your amazing, amazing studio. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for coming. We always enjoy your visits here and, and the new things you bring to show us. Sounds good. Thank you. When choosing the electronics to pair with Barrows and Wilkins speakers, one exceptional option is Class A Audio. Founded in 1979 by Greek immigrant Mike Vigilis, Class A has become synonymous with pristine music reproduction. Trusted by some of the world's finest recording studios, pairing Class A electronics in Barrows and Wilkins speakers is sure to impress even the most discerning audio enthusiasts. Now let's take a look at the Class A lineup. First, we have the Class A Delta Pre. It is the ultimate foundation for any stereo system. The Delta Pre offers a great deal of flexibility with features like digital bypass for analog sources and a five band digital domain parametric equalizer. Touchscreen interface in the beautiful anodized aluminum body ensures an enjoyable luxury experience. The Delta amplifiers are built to drive the world's most demanding loudspeakers with precision and authority. Both models use massive toroidal power supplies and weigh over 100 pounds. Let's look at these amplifiers. The Delta Mono embodies exquisite, controlled, unending power. A perfectly detailed enclosure cradles a highly innovative blend of technologies and hand-selected components, which deliver effortless, refined sound. The Delta Mono is crafted for exceptional performance and durability. Every detail is superbly refined. The first 35 watts of power are pure Class A. Next is the Delta Stereo. The Delta Stereo distills all of Class A's innovation and knowledge into a compact, high-performance stereo amplifier. In situations where dual mono amplifiers can't be accommodated, Delta Stereo offers uncompromising performance in a single component. The first 12 and a half watts of power output are pure Class A. And with a total of 250 watts per channel into eight ohms, it can drive virtually any speaker. We hope you enjoyed the video uh, with John Newton. He's an amazing guy. He's, uh, he's great to talk to and he's a wealth of knowledge. You know, he has a lot of passion in the, uh, you know, music industry and he's not afraid to, you know, share that with his great body of work <coughs> that he has exhibited over time. So I have, uh, you know, obviously myself here, uh, Dave Nauber, the brand director from Class A and Eric McBride, the premium audio brand manager. So between these two guys, if it's a Class A or a Bowers of Wilkins question, we completely have you covered. So without further ado, we're going to jump right into it, guys. Jump in. So there's a lot of questions here, so let's pick a good one to start. Right, so this is a question about the uh, the solid body tweeter. Um, you know, the looking at the, the D4 um, compared to the D3, you know, the tweeter's right on top. It's one of the glaring differences. So can you maybe elaborate on that? Yeah. That's your 800 D4 tweeter. Right? This is what it starts out as. Solid piece of billet aluminum, and then we machine it down so then it ultimately looks like this. And again, we're able to achieve this, uh, this elongated tube because of what the advancements that we made within the diamond tweeter itself, making it more efficient. And we also thought aesthetically it looked nicer as well. So that's what you get. So this, remember, this is what the tweeter starts off as, and this is what it looks like at the end. Very cool. It's awesome. It's substantial. It a ton. You know, it's, it's you know, <laughs> yeah. we do a lot of trainings and we have these bits and we <laughs> exactly right. We put it in somebody's hand and then and then there it goes. Right. It has a lot of weight to it. Um, but, you know, that 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 weight qualifies to inertness, which is going to tone down all those resonances. That's really important when we're talking about the detail that comes through. Of course. Twitter. 100%. Um, so we have another technical question. This one will be for you, uh, Eric. You know, it's kind of maybe a follow up on the video is you mentioned motor assembly a few times. You know, what is that? and Why is that important? Yeah, so the motor assembly is essentially everything that allows the driver to move. So uh, it, it consists of a top plate, a rear plate, and then what we call a pole piece. And so if you can imagine the actual coil itself rests in that pole piece area, and then when the magnet is fed the signal, obviously that allows the, uh, the actual coil to move up and down. So that's where you get your excursion, right? So one of the one of the challenges with 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 typical motor uh, assemblies using like like standard metal uh, is that it creates a, a number of uh, a d of different resonances or or even EMI and this EMI actually causes some distortion within that driver. 
So what we did was on the headed project, actually on all the uh, mid ranges for the all the FST mid ranges. Sorry, uh, we went from a standard metal uh, plating system to a double copper plating system. So what that does is it greatly reduces the amount of EMI, thus resulting in higher resolution and detail. With the 801, we took it a step further. We decided to go away from the copper and actually use silver top plates. So silver, better, better sound, right? Right. Makes sense? You know, I'm going to throw a follow-up on there with you. You know, you, um, so the, you mentioned starting with the FST, right? Yeah. Uh, which is essentially any of the three-way applications, that's the 804 and up. Uh, but could you maybe give us a little explanation of what FST is? Yeah, FST is really cool. We've been using this for a number of years. Um, so it's, it stands for fixed, fixed Suspension Transducer. So what that means essentially is that the, the actual cone itself does not excurd too much, right? It actually just vibrates. So it's only found on our mid-range. So if you can imagine, if we had a standard cone there, a, a standard surround, I should say, um, when the when the speaker is actually playing, there's there's standing waves or resonances that travel across the cone. With a standard surround, what happens is those standing waves hit the surround and then bounce back towards the center of the cone. That's not good. What that ultimately does is create distortion. So what the FST does, it actually there's a roll off. So it actually eliminates diffraction, but then there's a little like foam core that you can see on the outer edge of this driver. And all those resonances ultimately get absorbed there. So less distortion. Right, right. Yeah. which is real important. We're talking mid-range here, right? So that's the very delicate you know, frequencies where you want to have that clarity. And you know, people listen to Bowers and Wilkins over the years, you know, mid-range clarity is really a hallmark of the brand, oh, yeah, right? It does a tremendous job. Um, so we didn't bring Dave on for nothing, so I figured we should throw you a question, <laughs> right? Um, all right, so we do have, a, it's kind of two questions here, but I think it's um, easy to combine. So it's talking about the Delta amps. So um, you know, what are the meters represented on the front? Uh, then also a question about the benefits of the IC tunnel. Sure. Well, first, before I answer those questions, I'd like to address the elephant in the room, oh, God. which is that I'm sitting between Eric and Derek. <laughs> and I just wanted to know, are those your stage names or, or are they actually on your birth certificate? No, we actually have a stage name. We do have a stage name. Uh, we'll disclose it live. Yeah, right? It's, it's Hans and Franz. Yeah. Uh, it's it's Hans and Franz. Okay. Personal joke between us. have done a lot of trainings together. But thanks for that, Derek. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, the meters. Um, the meters have... Uh, two primary purposes. Uh, the first is to confirm the, <clears throat> the amount of output power. So they actually show you in watts at 8 ohms how much power the amplifier is delivering. Uh, you might say, well, why do I need to know how much power the amp is delivering? And the real answer is you probably don't. If you're a reviewer, um, if you're testing the amplifier, there are reasons why you would want to know exactly what the power output is. But um, for a lot of people, it's entertainment. So um, we like to look at the meter while uh, the amplifiers are playing music. So they have an entertainment value as well as uh, delivering actual um, uh, power at 8 ohms. Um, the other one, IC tunnel? IC tunnel, yeah. IC tunnel is a big part of the design, a very important part of the design. Um, if you were to look at the data sheet or the spec sheet for a given part in the amplifier, a capacitor, a transistor, or whatever. Um, typically, they express the performance of that part in terms of temperature. Um, if you imagine that there are thousands of parts inside and every one of the parts varies a bit as the temperature varies, you can imagine that the sound quality will change as the temperature changes. And, um, and so it's very important to address that concern. Uh, if you have a conventional heat sink, then you don't really have control of the temperature. It just is letting the, uh, the system cool to the best it can, but the ambient temperature and all sorts of other factors will influence what the temperatures of the parts inside are. So we get control of the temperature by controlling um, the way that uh, the heat is removed from the amplifier. We have this IC tunnel, which the uh, audio channels are attached to, the output devices are um, screwed onto, and there's a fan, and there are fins inside, and the speed of the fan varies with the amount of heat that's being produced. So it quickly rises to the optimum temperature, and no matter how loud you play the amp, no matter what speaker, no matter what, what room it's in, we always maintain that same operating temperature. Right. So that's the real primary advantage is, is you get a performance benefit 
benefit from knowing exactly the performance of um, each part because it's operating at a known temperature. There are other advantages. It um, will extend the life of the product. So the hotter uh, electronics work, the less their overall lifespan will be. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't let them overheat which is important. We have Class A circuitry happening there, so we don't want them to get too hot. Right. And uh, third benefit is it allows us to position the amplifier or place the amplifier uh, very um, flexibly so we can put it in an equipment rack without a lot of space all around it. Um, so it's very efficient with space. We can put it into a cabinet and yep. it'll um, uh, remain cool as long as you give a place for the warm air to go. So um, you can use this amp where conventional amplifiers don't really want to go. Yeah. Right. So that's great. Kind of a long answer, but no, that's, that's perfect. The, uh, that's right. that's I mean, you know, to, I don't mean to sum it up in a simple statement for you, Dave, but it's consistent performance, right? Oh, it, absolutely. It, it keeps that's it running it, yeah. at the right temperature so you can get consistent performance, whether you're in the first 10 minutes of the movie, or you're at the, the, at the grand finale, uh, which is really important. Uh, all right. So what do we got? What do we got? We got some more. You want one? Sure. All right, here we go. Um, so uh, can you better explain the changes on the back of the base drivers? Better explain the changes on the back of the base drivers? Yep. Yep. So nope. what were the overall? <laughs> <laughs> no, I you did. You did do yeah. a pretty good job. No, I did do yeah. a pretty good job. <laughs> well, well, so yeah, so obviously it's the same cone, aerofoil technology. We have the uh, anti-resonance plug. What's happening behind, there is a, a new spider assembly and there is a new motor assembly as well. So the, the spider itself is uh, uh, your standard, like like typical cloth fabric, um, uh, silk spider that, that we had before, but it's just been re-engineered slightly to allow the throw, the excursion to be a little bit more and, and it's a little bit more lightweight too. So it's just easier to drive it. So it's a little bit more efficient, let's call it. Uh, and then the motor assembly, we've up, uh, updated the metal. Unfortunately, I'm not 100% on what metal we are now using. I know it's not copper or silver, um, but it, it is a different metal that has, that has a reduction in EMI, essentially. So I hope that helps. Uh, all right, so we have a couple of good questions here. Um, let's see. Um, so this is a great question. Uh, to the ears of not highly experienced end users, how can you define the sonic difference between D3 and D4? Do you want to take it? And then I'll jump on, or do you want? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so it's, um, so th there's a, another question here about some of the mid-range changes too. Yep. So ultimately I think that you could, you could oh, yeah. tie into yeah, that. Yeah, so I think obviously the biggest advancements, advancements that we've made really are, well, it's everywhere really, but the cabinet is, is much stronger, obviously. So you get a reduction in, in resonances, so that results in deeper, tighter, Base a little bit more broadband base is what you 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 can expect to hear from the D4. Uh, the mid range due to the BMS, which we'll get into in a, in a few minutes. Um, I'm sure we will probably someone will, will ask it. Uh, the BMS because we're reducing that critical mid range band uh, dramatically in terms of uh, coloration and distortion. You can expect higher, you know, more more resolution and detail within that mid range. So the tonality is just going to be much more crisp and more accurate. And then with the tweeter, because the advancements we made with the uh, the actual former itself and the elongated tweeter tube, the result there again is just higher resolution of distortion. So ultimately, the difference from D3 to D4, it's going to sound cleaner, right? And it's going to actually sound like it has more bass because it's more broadband because it's tighter and more controlled. Does that do it? Yeah, yeah, that definitely does it. Uh, we actually do have a uh, a biomimetic question here, so. Um, you know, it's a question about, you know, what is the, the real advantage to this and, you know, how, how is this actually measured? Yeah, so I actually have, so again, that's the BMS. This is the, you know, your typical spider that you find on the back of, let's say, a mid-range. So when this is oscillating, right, and you saw that in the animations, this essentially, you know, it's picking up all the rear standing waves that are coming from the cone. And what essentially what it happens is this acts almost like another speaker. So it bounces off of this and then comes back through the cone, creating that distortion. When you do th use this, you can see there's much, there's, there's a lot less points where the sound, the, the diffracted sound coming from the back can bounce off of. So, so the result is uh, amazing clarity, right, in resolution. So we tested this. So we tested this, again, critical mid-range frequencies from, I think it was 400 hertz up to 4K. And what we found across the entire uh, bandwidth was at least a 20 dB down in terms of THD, so total harmonic distortion coming down. 
um, at one kilohertz, we actually had the most dramatic um, difference. It was an 80 dB down difference at 1K. Yeah. 1K is important, people, right? That's where your measurements, that's where the speech is, right? So you can imagine beforehand, we had 80 more dB of coloration, I guess you could say, right? right? At that critical frequency. Now right. we've completely removed that. So I right. think that's pretty cool. Right, and yeah. I, I think that that removal of that, you know, added residency is really is one of the big things that stands out between D three and D four. Yeah, you know, we were listening to a uh, an amazing track. It was um it was a uh, Sarah Close uh, London was the name yes. of the track, right? Beautiful female vocal track over a soft piano, and the complete tone of her voice shifted when we went from D three to D four. Um, so, you know, you, you can put whatever analogy you want. She's in the room. She was there. She's not there. I feel like I'm in the concert hall as opposed to, you know, it's it just it, the, the whole tone and um, really the realism of the performance really was, was accentuated. Uh, so we do have another question here. Um, I will take it as re regarding the um, comment on the Connolly leather um, interface and does it have any acoustic benefits? Um, so, you know, for anyone that doesn't know what uh, that's referring to is if you see on top there it can be a little vanna mm -hmm. there you go perfect mm -hmm. um, so that's that top collar piece right there um, and there's a couple of things here is you know I want to use the best way to describe it is you know I wouldn't go with a significant acoustic benefit but it was certainly an acoustic consideration taken into place meaning through the voicing and designing of tuning in the process material selection was made to make sure that we got you know the best response that we want um, but the real star of the show isn't necessarily the leather itself but it's that top plate that the leather sits on mm -hmm. so it, it's not just to make it look pretty it's because it's it's a nice inlay to a aluminum plate that really stiffens the cabinet um, and that that plate is um, was an addition on the top but also the bottom, bottom of the cabinet as well, as yep. well. Um, to really strengthen that up to control it any additional residency. And to kind of jump on that as well, it also allowed a stronger uh, ta attachment point for, for the turbine. This turbine's not light. This turbine weighs 50 pounds, right? Maybe 55 pounds? <laughs> yep. At least. It's heavy, right? So, I mean, before that, it was actually mounted to the wooden cabinet. Now we have this nice aluminum top plate, so that again, that attachment point is just much more, it's rigid, even though we have all that decoupling, it's just, it's just much more inert, essentially. <clears throat> All right, so we do have a question here for you, Dave. It's a, a, a good question, given uh, the name of your favorite brand. Um, but, you know, what is Class A amplification, and why is it better or worse than uh, AB or Class D? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> good luck. So, uh, <laughs> how much time do we have? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, I'll, uh, I'll do my best to explain it in a, with a kind of an analogy. Okay. Um, a, a Class A amplifier is... Uh, typically built as uh, what we call push-pull. And if you think about um, the way I, I imagine it is you've got the two speaker terminals and um, you have um, an amplifier that has two halves. And um, one half is amplifying the positive part of the signal and the other half is amplifying the negative part of the signal. So when they attach to the speaker, uh, one of them is pushing the driver out away from the cabinet and the other is pulling it back on the opposite side and what a class a amplifier does is it keeps both the positive and negative uh, halves of the amplifier pushing and pulling the speaker throughout the entire cycle back and forth um, it's uh, it's like two people who are um, sawing uh, a log with a double-handed saw. They're both pushing and pulling through the entire cycle. Uh, what a class A, uh, what a class AB amplifier does is it um, at one point will let one side of the amp will let go and allow the other uh, half to do all the work. And so it's that point where it's letting go where you get this distortion that's called crossover distortion and class A amplifiers don't have any of that. So that's 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 one way to way kind of describe it without sure. uh, without getting into um, uh, math. <laughs> math. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, no math live. So always a rule. You never do math live. Uh, I was looking for the whiteboard. There was no whiteboard. <laughs> no yet, whiteboard. So. We are no. in Boston. There's equations everywhere. <laughs> no, no, no math. 
it's you know where is the 800 d4 series manufactured right so it's england right uh it, it's in the um the factory where they've always been manufactured there's been a significant amount of enhancements to the factory in the line um to produce a new range and the new technologies um, but from Bowers and Wilkins, all the 800 series product, as well as our CT8 lineup, is manufactured in the UK. All right, so we have a couple more questions here. Um, so Eric, this one will be for you. It's uh, referring to the the turbine head. Uh, so the turbine head is is, is a large uh, head that the um, the mid range sits in, um, and it refers to uh, TMDs. So what are TMDs, and what do they do? Yeah, so tune mass dampeners. It, it could be a number of, di of different um, materials that you can use and ways to actually uh, implement them. So, I mean, even though this is a, a tremendous piece of technology, the turbine itself, inside we have fins, radiating fins, that essentially help help keep the turbine from, from resonating at certain frequencies. But the reality is it's, it's a big piece of aluminum. When you put sound through it, things are going to vibrate, right? So what we've done is we've taken these things called tuned mass dampeners, and we've measured unit using finite element analysis on where these resonances are, and we've literally put these tuned mass dampeners, which is like a big decoupling pad, call it, uh, on those specific locations. So, I mean, if you ever saw the inside of it, which I think we show in the video, you can see kind of these little circular pieces mounted inside, and those are the tuned mass dampeners. What we also did to those, we actually added some uh, acoustic insulation in the back of the turbine. Uh, we actually doubled that up as well. And then on the fins that I was was telling you about, because we need a connection point, right? The mid-range needs to, needs to connect to something. So where those fins are, we've actually added some decoupling material around each fin as well to prevent them from, from singing. So again, result, less distortion. That's what we do. Right, well, I, I hate to kind of piggyback directly on that, but there's a question regarding the HTM models and, and that metal range pod, so. Yeah, so this is really cool. This is something we've never done before. We've, uh, we've obviously we can't put a turbine on a center channel. So what we did was we explored uh, building a mid-range pod assembly, which is made out of aluminum. And this pod assembly actually sits behind the FST mid-range. And within this pod, there's uh, insulation, there's uh, several different types of, of, um, of shapes and everything that just help diffract and absorb the sound internally. So it's essentially like taking a smaller version of a turbine head and putting it inside a cabinet. So you don't actually see it, but it is there and it makes a dramatic difference in overall mid-range tonality. And it's a center channel. Yeah, <laughs> right. Kind so of important. <laughs> this is this is where th that really lives, right? Which is right. is great too, you know. And it's important that you're aware of that fact because you know, at first glance, you know, a a uneducated consumer or or dealer might look at the center channel and, and think that we just slapped a tweeter on yeah, top, right? Um, and we made a significant uh, investment and design change um, by putting that mid-range pod Absolutely. behind the, behind that mid-range driver. Um, so Eric, I hope you're ready, man. We got we got a couple more lined up for oh, you. Oh boy. Um, so all right. So let's do. You know, he's got three skews. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, so <laughs> have the stands <laughs> on the 805 D4 and HDM models changed? Are there any benefits? Yeah, they have absolutely. Uh, the biggest change. So the HDM is, is it looks different, right? So so the the base itself is a little bit more elegant. Um, obviously, still has the four posts. Top plate has been slightly re re engineered, but it's always had four connection points. So to mount the HTM to the HTM stand, you always had four screws that would essentially mount into it. What the 805 has trained, changed dramatically. So now we uh, have a different base, right? It's more elegant to match the HTM as well. Uh, the posts look slightly different as well, but you can still fill them in with uh, sand, all right, for, for dampening. Uh, but the top plate's the biggest change. It's, it's, it's actually much larger. And now we have four connection posts. So if you remember with D3, D2, original, you only had uh, a front and a back. Now we have two front and two back. Uh, and we also updated our spikes and rubber feet on the stands as well. So they actually look like an 800 series spike. They're substantial. Foot. Yeah, substantial. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, speaking of substantial, the uh, the FS, um, so the floor stand for the 805, so if you pick up one of those oh. boxes, just, just brace yourself. It's brutal. It, it, it's not yeah. it's not fun. Uh, <laughs> they have a lot of weight to them, uh, and they're, they're packed together in one box. So, I mean, it, it's one of those classic is, why do these cost this much? Like, Mr. Customer, would you mind just yeah, picking pick up this box up. for me yeah, right there? Yeah. So, I mean, they they um, they have a good price tag on them, but it is really due to, you know, their, their design and, and how well they are built. And again, we, we didn't make them heavier to bring 
break your back. We made them heavier <laughs> to make them sound better, this right? That that's why we did it. So. That's true. <clears throat> All right. So uh, we have another one here for you. It's regarding the the new 804, Eric. Um, and this is the first time the 804 received a plinth. Yes. Uh, so what's what's the acoustic benefits of that? Yeah. So there's a couple things. Uh, obviously, you know, in t in terms of uh, stability, that's huge, right? Uh, the 804 D3 with the feet that we provided, it was a little sketchy. If you had a big dog or an overzealous young young child, you know, you never know what could happen, right? Like this guy does, yeah. right? <laughs> so um, so the plinth adds stability. Um, so that's number one. Number two, uh, it allowed us to move the port to underneath, so to align with the headed product as well. So essentially, what that does now, all all of the port the the, the port uh, stuff stuff uh, the port now discharged basically uh, underneath the loudspeaker. So that actually results in better time alignment. And what it also does is it's it prevents you having any issues with boundary reinforcement, right? So have, having something on the front or on the rear of the cabinet, then you kind of have to worry about where you place them. So that you have a little bit more flexibility in terms of placement with the 804 now. Um, and so it's it's more stability. You get the time alignment, and then obviously we have the better spikes and better feet now yep. that we can incorporate with that loudspeaker. Yep, yep. You know, kind of one kind of you know note to say is while the plinth is it definitely helps stability. It's not the same exact construction as it is on the head and models due to size and you know requirements. Um, and kind of the most notable exception is there's no casters, casters. in yep. the 804. It's just spikes, uh, which you know once you get into the weight of the, the headed models, you know, 803, uh, 802, and 801, you can really appreciate those casters. Um, and those casters have actually been updated too. So before they were kind of front to back casters, now they allow kind of 360 degrees. So as you're working with toe-in and so forth, um, you can do that much um, easier. It's easier, yeah. It's much easier. And don't yeah. forget about the outriggers. I, t I touch on it in the video, but we don't actually show you. It's good, I can't show you right now because we have one camera and it's fixed on us. And so, so, but it, it's essentially you have two points in the rear of the plinth on the headed products, and it allows you to actually lower these down for even more stability. But what I find it it's really great for is is dialing in your speakers, right? When you're dialing in di dialing in your left and your right, uh, I lower the the inside uh, outrigger, and then I kind of pivot off of that when I'm adjusting my toe. Right, so it's a really cool, nice little connection spot to the floor, and it gets you really, really close. And then you can lower down the spikes and really get it, get that sucker uh, in there. Yep. Um, all right, so we actually do have uh, another Class A question here. Um, it's good old roadmap question, probably your favorite type of questions, right? Uh, but the question <laughs> is: is um, do you foresee any Class A integrated amp in the future? Yes. So awesome. um, yes, we're. Uh, we're looking at that now. We've got uh, a couple of multi-channel products that are on the um, roadmap in in front of the integrated amp. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so we'll we'll be addressing that category as well. But uh, there's a lot of interest in the integrated amp, and uh, we're eager to to show what we can do there. Yeah, awesome, uh, excellent. Yeah. yeah, I'm excited for that. Me too. Um, all right, so we do have another question here for you, Eric. It's uh, talking about the rear spine. You know, it has you know great design detail. It looks beautiful, but you know, what is the is there any benefit to having it? Yeah, so a, a, a couple of a couple of things, obviously. Um, number one, uh, you know, when the crossovers are located inside the speaker, that takes up cubic volume, right? And you also got to remember, there's a lot of pressure happening inside that that cabinet. So, and these are very delicate parts. So, all of this com compression, uh, you know, all of this, you know, base nodes, everything in there bouncing around. You know, we just felt that it would be easier. Let, 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 let's take these com these very delicate components and let's put them on the outside of the loudspeaker. So, we have the spine, right, which is on every single model now, except for the HTMs. And what it allows us to do is actually mount the crossover to the spine. So the, each individual crossover network utilizes what we call a Powertron thermal resistor. This resistor is very important to the to the to, for, to, for, really important important to the tuning of the loudspeaker. Sorry, um, and th this resistor needs to uh, release heat. So the spine actually acts as a heat sink, right? So that's the second thing. And number three, which you know, for someone who works on speakers a lot, serviceability is huge, right? So uh, no one likes you know removing a driver and then going in and trying to take out a crossover. You know, in the unlikely event that you actually do need to access the crossover, it's literally eight little tiny screws, and that whole thing pops up. Um, so I'm not really sure what this means, but it, the question is minimum room size. Um, I can answer that sure. as if I because I have large speakers in a very small room. Yes, you do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I am um, I am fortunate to have a pair of 800 uh, D3s in my living room, and I have a small living room. Um, you know, so it's it's 
is no real right or wrong where it comes to that. Um, there is certainly a benefit to have a larger space to quote unquote let things breathe maybe. Um, but that more so in, in my opinion, and I'm not even gonna ask this to Eric because we don't have that much time. Yeah. Um, but it, it's more about um, the, the shape of the room, uh, where you are positioned in the room, uh, and those changes and make a much bigger acoustic difference than, than the overall size of the room. I mean, obviously there's extremes. There's tiny, tiny spaces and then there's massive spaces, but you know, seeing within an average range, there's no real, real minimum per se, um, but it does certainly help to let the speakers breathe a little bit as well as being positioned in the right spot in the room. Yeah, to, to just, just to kind of, I'll be quick. Quick. To sum it up. Yeah. <laughs> um, Obviously, the bigger the space, the better the system as a whole is just gonna, it's gonna react better, right? So, uh, you know, if you have a room that's four by four and you put, you know, 801s in it, it's gonna be loud, but you're gonna hear, you're gonna hear a lot, right? It's it's gonna be very concussive, let's just say. So, so yeah, the bigger the space that, that, that you can provide for the system, it just ultimately you're just allowing those those remotes uh, uh, time to breathe, time to cancel out on their own. So you don't have to worry about any of that stuff going on. Great. Um, so we have uh, two more questions here. Um, so one of them I'll, I'll take, it's, uh, it's actually something we already referred to, it's what are the holes on the 803 plinths? Um, so those holes on the outside are for those outriggers that Eric mentioned. Yep. Um, so essentially once you get your, your speaker um, in the position that you like, um, doesn't necessarily have to be the final position as Eric mentioned, you could lock one of those um, outriggers down, use that as a pivot point so that way you have a, a nice clean angle coming in, but then ultimately lock those down in place. And it's important to note it, it's not, uh, the spikes is what deliver the real acoustic benefit, yeah. the outriggers are really for stability. Yeah, and just to touch on that too is it, when you when you unbox the loudspeaker, there's going to be holes there. So you might look at that and be like, oh, what is that all about? Uh, within the accessory pack are the actual outriggers. So you have the actual foot that screws down into that hole, and then you have a cap that goes over that that gives it, an, that gives it a nice uh, finish, finished look. So don't be scared. Those holes will, will go away. <laughs> All right, we do have a, a quick uh, roadmap question for yourself, I think piggyback on the integrated. Um, but the question of um, any any thoughts or plans on doing a um, a music streamer from Class A? Uh, the answer is um, both yes and no. So we make a preamplifier now that has uh, um, network streaming capability. So it's a renderer. It also happens to have a phono stage and analog inputs and, and, and so it's a very flexible preamp. It can do a lot mm -hmm. of things. But it does not have media player functionality. So right. when you turn it on, it doesn't do title. Um, you can hook up a computer that does title or you can stream title on your network uh, from a NAS drive or whatever. I'm sorry. You, you, you can stream data from a NAS <laughs> drive, yourself, from, 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 <laughs> from, from Tidal, from whatever. So there are all sorts of ways that the preamp, as it is today, can be used with streaming. Right. But it doesn't have those media player um, capabilities. We will be adding those. And okay. anybody who has a, a Delta Pre today or buys one in the next six months or whatever, um, they'll be able to buy this upgrade to give it that capability oh, along awesome. with some other things. So uh, yeah, so it'll have, uh, it'll, it'll have everything you need as a full streamer, but it will do other things. Awesome. So That's Derek, great to hear. Yeah, Derek and I are learning that for the first time as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm making yeah. a note of that. Well, yeah. We're going to hold you to that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no problem. All right, so um, looking at the <clears throat> Q&A, looks like we're about through our questions here. We're almost at time. So I uh, want to thank everybody for attending, but before we sign off, we, we have a couple of things that we like to do, um, a quick plug. Uh, one of them is something that I think is absolutely incredible, um, and that's Sound United Sound Start Foundation. Um, if you haven't heard of our Sound Start Foundation, uh, what this is, is it's a give back program that we have as an organization to put musical instruments in the hands of children. Um, there's a lot of pressure within uh, educational organizations to maintain certain dollar amounts within their budgets and oftentimes they will uh, remove some of the arts in, in music classes um, due to the high cost of, of executing those. Um, so, year to, um, so I should say since its incarnation we've delivered 
uh, 10,000 instruments in the hands of children, uh, which is amazing. You know, we it's see incredible. we have a, a great promo video and, and you see the reaction to these music teachers and these kids. And, and I mean, we're in an audio company, right? So, you know, musicians is, is critical to everything that we do. It's kind of a um, And getting them in at a young age is, is absolutely awesome. So uh, we're not stopping there. Uh, we're we're going to continue this and we're, we're hoping to double down and, and eventually get to 20,000 plus with our, our donations. Um, so if you like more information on that, um, soundstartfoundation.org is a landing page to give you a little bit more info on, on that organization. All right. And uh, the last thing I want to mention before we sign off here um, is we do have an amazing YouTube channel. Um, so if you search Sound United Training on YouTube and subscribe, uh, we have all types of content on there where we go into a lot of detail of um, many products that we offer. And that YouTube channel, the subscribers are getting really high and the content it will ever grow. So definitely subscribe to that and you can get more content from us at Sound United. So that'll do it. Yeah, so again, thanks again for joining us. We, get, we can't thank you enough. Thank you, Dave. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank Good you. to see you. At Bowers and Wilkins 800 Series Diamond, is everything we know and everything we are. Stay classy. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>